Hello, everyone, and welcome to another um, iteration of the Engage Divio Engage Committee um, webinar series. So today, uh, moderated by Sarita Gupta from uh, from Rice, we'll have a webinar on how to apply for independent postdoc positions, uh, fellowships, funding, various types of things and opportunities that are out there. And I think many of you are interested to know what what happens behind the scene, how to apply for these things, how to approach these opportunities, and how to benefit from them. Uh, we have uh, three uh, panelists who have managed to get some form of these fellowships, and they'll tell you a little bit about the experiences they had and um, how they got there. So Anchor Jing from uh, Whitehead Institute at MIT, Mai Jai Lia, uh, who is an assistant professor at Northeastern, um, and Benny Tai, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Yale. Um, so we are very excited to have all of you here. Uh, as you may know, we have many webinars come uh, sort of regularly uh, organized at True Engage, and the next one um, would be in October. Uh, it might not apply to many of you because it's about applying to graduate school. So you probably, if you're here, you probably know how to do that. But if you know someone who would benefit from that, please forward the link to them, and so they can they can join the webinar as well. So without any further ado, so I'll leave um, oh give give the stage to Sartex so he can start um sort of this webinar exciting exciting webinar. Uh, thank you, Mita. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sartha Gupta. I am a center fellow at Center of Theoretical Biological Physics at Rice University, Houston. And it's a great pleasure today to organize this panel, demystifying the independent postdoctoral funding, process, the application process. I'm also a postdoc, so I'm like, this is a great chance to me for learn something from the successful applicants and everybody else in the community as well. Uh, let me introduce the panelists briefly and their research. So we have today, the first member is Dr. Ankur Jain. He's a student professor of biology at MIT and a core member of Whitehead Institute. Uh, his lab focuses on how do st cells stay organized, focusing on understanding how membrane-free cellular compartment forms and functions, especially RNA granules. Uh, he has been awarded NIH K99 funding during his postdoctoral days, and we would love to hear what was what that entails. Uh, next, we have Professor Maizao Leo. She's a student professor of physics at Northeastern University. And her lab focuses on understanding the link between neural structure and underlying molecular mechanics. They use multiple uh, techniques from single molecular imaging to superficial microscopy, physical modeling to understand how this neuron structure and function emerge from elementary molecular processes. She has been a re recipient of Burroughs Welcome Funding uh, during her postdoc years, and we will learn about the application process from her. Uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Jung Shen or Benny. Uh, who's a great friend and a uh, postdoctoral researcher at uh, Jin Yang's lab. Uh, he focuses on physics of bacterial biofilm, especially the heterogeneities of the biofilm and how it shaped the special, uh, spatial segregation and the social aspect of the evolutionary or uh, evolution of the uh, uh, biofilm matrix production as well over evolutionary time scales. He's a recipient of Damien Ringen postdoctoral funding and we'll learn about uh, these the funding process. So thank you so much for all the panel members for giving your time to us and your expertise. We would love to hear more about your thing, application processes. So the first question to just to start the uh, discussions is that, how did you decide to apply for this particular fellowship that you got? And what's the typical timeline of this application process looks like? Uh, let me uh, call Professor Jan to start. Right, so um, I guess uh, you're asking about K99 specifically, yeah. from, right? So I applied in uh, the second year of my postdoc, towards the end of the second year of my postdoc. Uh, the rationale was uh, K99 uh, had, at that point had instituted this four year limit. You can only apply or receive funding um, within the first four years of your start of postdoctoral training. And I'd also heard that many people may need to reapply. Like after the first submission, I wanted to have an opportunity to revise and resubmit. And two years was sort of sufficient for me to gain some preliminary data. At that point, I still did not have a publication from my postdoc, uh, but I thought um, I will apply and just uh, 
take this chance and make sure, like, you know, get, get some opportunity to get feedback and revise the application as needed. Um, so in my first submission, it was uh, decently scored, but it was at the borderline. It did not get funded. <clears throat> so I submitted a revised application. Uh, by then I had a paper which was uh, submitted but not accepted. I could include that in the comments and then it, was, it went through quite smoothly. Uh, Benny? Yeah, so, so my fellowship is the Damon Ronyon Fellowship. And so this is a, uh, I would say the so-called early career, early career postdoc fellowship. Um, so this kind of fellowships, I think, along with other fellowships, for example, like Jane Coffin Childs or like, for example, like human, wait, what's it called? Uh, uh, wait, Life Science Research Foundation. Uh, there, there are a bunch of other uh, uh, postdoc fellowships. They typically have a time constraint. So uh, they, they, they want the applicants to apply within, uh, let's say, 18 months or two years after they finish their PhD. Or, uh, or so they, they basically don't want, they want to fund uh, postdoc who, for not too too long into their postdoctoral career, so uh, so for me, I personally uh, started I per personally started to think about fellowship, uh, start to let's say uh, construct the skeleton of my fellowship, uh, let's say proposal, uh, pretty much uh, uh, right after I start my uh, postdoc. So I didn't start uh, my postdoc with a fellowship. I was hired as a postdoctoral associate. But uh, but then uh, so my advisor gave me quite a few uh, quite a bit of information and uh, and there's some pretty prominent and pretty well known fellowships that's uh, that's just around. Um, so I think so the I started my postdoc in uh, September 2020, and then uh, I think at the end of 2020 I already started to think about it and uh, and the deadlines that I applied to, so there are two um, that I applied to, Jane Coffin Childs and Damon Ronyan. The deadlines are in uh, February and March next year, so 2021. So I started to draft my proposals in early 2021, and I started to uh, apply to these fellowships. So yeah, so I think basically you would probably want to start pretty early in your postdoctoral, postdoctoral career, if not, I mean, before you start. Uh, because they typically have a pretty uh, pretty hard time constraint. You need to apply as early as possible. Yeah. Thank you. From Isa. Hey, uh, so for my experience, I, uh, so in the beginning of my postdoc, I didn't realize that I can apply for postdoc fellowships until I probably at the, uh, Early second year, I heard from my friends that there are NIH, these kind of opportunities available. But for me, it's kind of special because I'm trained as a soft matter physicist during my PhD and I transitioned to biophysics. So uh, I spent a long time making this transition and I realized probably NIH is more for people with a uh, uh, more consistent background. And then I realized uh, for, for for people who is making a big transition in their career, in their postdoc, probably Bar's Welcome is a good opportunity because they specialize to support physicists, mathematicians, computational scientists, or engineers to transition to uh, do a postdoc in biophysics research. Then, um, so I get to know this opportunity probably uh, around the middle of my second year um, at that time, I was uh, trying to learn as much I can in the new field and, and also try to uh, have an idea what I'm going to do as my first paper in my postdoc. Um, I think I get my first paper um, around the thir early third year. And at that, at that time, I think probably that's a good opportunity for me to start applying for uh, postdoc fellowships. And I tried uh, Bar's Welcome at that time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so given these different independent fellowship application that you guys uh, were doing, like what does the application process look like? What are, what are the materials and application packet? Um, and how did you manage to like, you know, write this? I'm pretty sure it was a very time consuming process. And how did you manage with that your research responsibilities? Uh, if you can explain uh, some of that. Let's start with the Dr. Maiza, do you want to start? 
maybe I'm uh, uh, Maiza. Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, so I can probably share with you some, um, some slides that I make oh, for oh. this. Yeah. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you can share, correct? So um, could you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, for, uh, I think I will just share my, my general advice for applying for the Barrett's Welcome. Um, so the, the main, uh, I think for Barrett's Welcome, it is actually a little bit, um, the requirement is probably a little bit away from the mainstream fundings. Uh, so they support research that is important but may not be funded by NIH. So uh, this is an interesting statement and this leaves a lot of room for uh, for people who transition to a new field to, to consider this funding opportunity. And also um, I think uh, the best advice that I um, that I can have for this kind of uh, for Bar's welcome is that you have to be uh, very innovative, think about big ideas. Uh, this probably is a little bit opposite to NIH K99, where you probably need a lot of data to support a hypothesis and have to make sure that your hypothesis work out. <laughs> um, and also, like I mentioned just now, um, it's a good opportunity for, for uh, people outside biology to do their postdoc in biology. So uh, this is also something that you can emphasize when you are uh, writing your proposal, you want to say um, that why you are the best per person to do this kind of research, how can you leverage your previous training um, to do the big questions that you propose? Yeah, so. Um, yeah, this is my general advice for the first welcome. Uh, did I answer your question or yes. is there anything that you want me to add? Yeah, I was wondering about what does the application packet consist of? Does it have proposal, recommendation letters, and like how long is it typically? Um, but yes, for for the birth welcome, it is a actually a very long process. Um, so let me see whether I can find the web page for that. Um. Okay, so it starts with a letter of intention. Um, this will, uh, usually you will receive the call around September and this letter of intention is probably one page limit where you will state why you're interested in this, uh, in this fellowship and what is, your, what is your brief idea and what kind, of, uh, uh, what kind of support you can get. And uh, um, you just try to maximize the chance of being getting noticed by using this one page limit. Um, then after two months, then uh, you will receive a notification whether you or get uh, wh whether you are invited for submitting full proposal. Um, and uh, the full proposal is composed of six page. Um, for this six page, you can either adopt the NIH format, uh, like have a background, uh, pre, uh, detailed work plan, and uh, talk about why you are the best person to do the research. And also during that time, you will have to request for reference letters, support letters, and also prepare your biosketch. Um, the deadline for the full proposal is around January of the next year. So, uh, early January, actually. Uh, so you can imagine that you will have to spend your whole Christmas writing and also get your reference letters ready before Christmas because I'm pretty sure your referees will be busy spending their holidays together with their family. So you have to plan everything ahead of time. Um, and once you've submitted your full proposal, um, after, after three months, probably the late of April, you will receive a notification whether you are selected for the interview. Um, so this is a stage which uh, the competition is getting quite intense because uh, 
usually there are 20 applicants are selected to go to the interview session, uh, 10 will be the final awardees. So at this stage, you will know that you have 50% of getting awarded and you really have to treat it seriously. And during this interview, you are allowed to have a five minute presentation followed by 15 minutes question and answer session. Um, that is that, that five, 15 minutes is the time that you will get grilled by, by the committee members. <laughs> And probably after one month, you will receive a notification whether you're getting awarded. Yeah, it's a long process, so I can yeah. probably add more detail. Yeah. So it seems like a very, very, very long and daunting process. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to share how was the process of Damien Rain? Yeah, sure, sure. I can share screens. Uh, can you see? We can see that. Yeah, so basically, uh, Damon Ryan, so unlike uh, Borough Welcome Fund or, uh, or K99, uh, those are transition grants, uh, Damon Ryan or like these earlier career postdoc fellowships, uh, they don't requ require as much. Uh, so basically, I don't, uh, yeah, so, so you wouldn't expect, you wouldn't be expected to have papers during this stage. So, uh, but I think, so regarding, I think there was a uh, something about timing, right? I think regarding timing, I think it would be, uh, I think realistically it would be good to have some, I think it would be better to have, uh, I, mean, I think after joining the lab, after some time, you will start to have better ideas. Um, once you start to do experiments, you start to uh, work on your projects, you will have better ideas of what kind of uh, uh, proposals, what, what, what kind of materials you want to put in your proposal. Uh, I think, and and, and this time, th th this duration doesn't need to be need to be too long. Like for example, for me, I joined the lab in uh, I started my postdoc in September twenty twenty, and then after I think three four months, I started to write my proposal. And I think this is a I think this is a good time. Like everything, anything like close to this would be a good time to to get a better picture of the of the projects, uh, but also keep keep within this two year or one one and a half years constraint. So, uh, so the process. Uh, one thing I want to mention more about Damon Ryan, Damon Ryan Fellowship, is that uh, if you go to the website of the of the fellowship, you will see that they say at the at the foundation they fund high risk, high reward cancer research. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, if you look at the awardees, look look at all the fellows, you will find that about half, or maybe a little bit more than half, it are really hardcore cancer research. And the others, they are uh, more like basic biomedical or biological research. So, uh, so I, I encourage people to maybe look uh, a little bit more beyond the, the title or the what they put in upfront, uh, because I think a lot of uh, cancer research foundation per se, they also fund quite a quite a few of uh, basic basic research. Yeah. So uh, if you miss those, th those would be uh, like missed opportunities. And then, so the deadline, uh, so the process is pretty. I think it's simpler than what uh, Maija just described. Uh, and let me go, yeah. So this, these are all the materials. They look a little bit intimidating, but they are not, uh, I think they are, so I think the most, the thing that would take most time is of course still the proposal. So the proposal is, so for Demiron, it was five pages. And for the other one, I applied to Jane Coffin Childs, I believe about three pages um, and excluding the figures or refer references. So yeah, typically three to five pages is the is the length limit for proposal, and then there are quite a few of other miscellaneous documents. For example, like references, you need three, and th this doesn't count your um, your current postdoc uh, advisor. And then uh, cover sheet is just like a cover letter. Um, yeah, some miscellaneous uh, documents. And for example, like I think the bio sketch, if you don't have it, if you didn't have it before, it would take you some time to write it. Uh, but again, I think the most time consuming thing is the proposal. So uh, other things uh, would still take some time. So you probably want to budget time. Yeah. And the process is just, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deadline you submit through some online system uh, with all the documents ready. And then, and then, yeah, and they will, they will, they will notify you uh, whether you get selected or not. Yeah, so that's basically the process. Oh, thank you very much.
Yeah. Good. Do you want to share what how does can internet application process work? Right. So I can start with um, like I don't have well prepared slides like uh, uh -huh. Benny and Maja did. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll first start with echoing what Benny said about uh, Damon Runyon. I also had Damon Runyon when I was a postdoc, and uh, although it is called a cancer research fellowship, but the award committee and the panel they understand the importance of basic research. And uh, at least half, if not more, of the researchers work on very broad uh, swaths of biology, not directly related to cancer in the immediate future. They understand the importance of basic uh, discoveries. Um, going back to the K99 uh, process, so of course it's a transition award. The structure is that it's supposed to fund one to two years of your training in your current lab and then three years of uh, independent work when you start your own laboratory, like the uh, Burroughs Welcome um, Career Award. So uh, being an NIH grant, there are many aspects. I'll just break them down into three parts. First part, of course, is your research. You need to provide uh, what uh, research are you going to conduct. It has to be you know, a proposal which is uh, new, exciting, but at the same time doable. Uh, uh, within the scope of your training or um, the resources that you have available in your mentor's laboratory. Uh, we can go into the research proposal aspect, but I assume that's uh, the most standard bit that most people are familiar with. What I think often gets missed that it is at the end of the day, a training award. So the training components are perhaps as important as your research component. You need to provide what new training you will gain during the mentored phase and how that will propel you towards starting your own independent career trajectory. Okay. So, you know, spend equal amounts of time preparing your training components. So there is a, you know, two to three page write-up of what new training you'll acquire, how you'll learn communication skills, how you'll network, you know, attend the conferences, etc. So don't take them too lightly. Uh, um, give, give them a due, a due regard. Uh, then, of course, it being an NIH grant, the third component will be a whole bunch of other paperwork, like what are the resources available, equipment at the place you are in, uh, your bio sketch, uh, support letters from collaborators, mentors, etc. Okay. So um, again, like to reiterate, uh, three components: one is the research proposal, second is your um, training plan. Third would be miscellaneous uh, documents, including support letters and resources available. In terms of timeline, I think, um, you know, people, uh, um, some of my trainees are in the process of applying for K99. What I often notice is that more people spend more time writing the research component. Uh, you know, I think maybe doing the reverse is a good idea. Start with the training component first. And, um, uh, it'll take a few iterations for it to, um, you, you'll need to revise it a few times, uh, ch check other people's documents. It can take anywhere between three to six months. Start early, uh, get some feedback on what an NIH grant looks like, what the study, study section looks at. Uh, see some examples of successful applications. Um, yeah, I'm happy to share if you are interested. Um, yeah, three to six months would be the timeline that I would recommend uh, generally for this kind of an award. Uh, that sounds good. Um, yeah, another question I had is like, how did you balance this time consuming nature of preparing an application with your ongoing research responsibility? Like, did you had like time set aside each week and how did you work on the like parts of this application? It seems like a daunting task listing you all the documents that would require to apply for any of these things. So I was wondering if you want to share some, some of that, what, what were your strategies for that? Uh, Ankur, do you want to start? Sure. So uh, I I think it uh, just doesn't apply to the the grants. Um, I think as you guys will progress in your career trajectories, you'll notice that writing is an important component. So what I often encourage, like I, right now, like uh, I'm an I'm reduced to an administrator, and I I am mostly juggling writing or, or, or not able to do any any actual science or scientific research, uh, like on the bench. Um, so. Uh, a good, like what I recommend all my trainees is set aside a fixed number of hours per week or sometime during the day where you will go back and write. 
you can write in terms of, you know, if you are preparing a manuscript, write that. Writing grants is a great exercise. People often do not appreciate how writing is a fantastic experimental design tool. It brings you a clarity of what you want to do, what are, you know, your key objectives from the experiment, why you are doing it. You'll notice some holes in your data, which often happens when people are writing the papers. You realize that there is one or two sentences that I need to accommodate and I don't have the experimental data to do that. So the sooner you do that, the better. So set aside a time, you know, half an hour each day or a couple of hours each week to write um, at, at all stages. And same applies when you're writing these grants. You can, of course, set aside a solid chunk of time to complete the materials closer to the date. Thank you. Uh, Maza, do you have anything to add? How did you manage the application process? Uh, well, I, I actually, the way that I do it is that I will prepare these uh, like budget plan or other like data management plan, these kind of small items beforehand and probably spend the last week before deadline and writing it continuously. <laughs> uh, well, this is, for me, I feel this is the most efficient uh, work style, but um, yeah, I think everyone can develop their own writing style in terms of grants uh, writing. Okay. Yeah. Vinny? Oh. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I don't have really good like practical advice for how to manage time and how, um, but I do think like writing like proposals or uh, for fellowships or grants, uh, I, yeah, as Anchor said, it's like an integral part of the research. So uh, it's not, yeah. So not, it's not necessarily like it, like research and writing, 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 writing is like two separate things. So they are kind of integrative, and then you could, uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of a, a whole thing in the in the research, and uh, and I think for a lot of these proposal uh, fellowships, like for example, I applied to two fellowships. And then uh, it's not like you are preparing like two uh, completely different uh, proposals. They are basically pretty similar. So, and it doesn't matter because these are all private foundations. And then you, and, 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 and actually you, uh, I would, you could not get two fellowships at the same time. So basically you have one set of research uh, ideas and then you will keep uh, applying to these fellowships until you get one. So yeah, that's another, that's another point. Yeah, and I think uh, over the years of like your scientific development, there seems to be you're 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 kind of nurturing like a body of knowledge and your research like ideas, and then for and then whenever you uh, whenever I I have this this task or mission of writing something, it, I'm kind of like uh, let's say uh, like I'm I'm kind of like carrying some of these ideas from the body and then try to try to materialize them into into writing. So. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it takes a lot of effort, but it's, it's also a fun and, um, rewarding process. Okay. Thank you, Benny. Uh, another thing, as, as Uncle was mentioning like a few minutes ago that, uh, this essentially like kind of a, among other things is that like a training fellowship kind of thing, you get trained on this thing and you have to show the funding agencies, like how will it help you? So I was wondering, like, what does a successful application have to have essential components? Like, how does it, uh, how did you show your application? Like, like you're an independent researcher, and like you, you, you are the person who should get this thing. Is there any components that everybody should keep in mind? Uh, of course, all research proposals are people are right, but I'm sure a lot of them get rejected. So, what do you think? Like, what does a successful app proposal, research proposal looks like? Uh, since you all have had them, do you have any things to share, Ankur? Oh, that's a tough one, right? <laughs> I think it's the whole package, um, you know, like uh, what your past track record is, which comes across in your bio sketch, um, what your, um, how exciting your research plan is. At the end of the day, they are going to fund the research and uh, two criteria that NIH uses uh, are, like among other things, they'll have scores. So um, uh, the two uh, criteria when evaluating the application when you get your scores are, can it be done? And should it be done? 
So these are encapsulated in uh, significance and uh, research plan and other, other, other scores. So key, always keep in mind you know, about your research proposal. Can it be done and should it be done, especially when you're applying to NIH type agencies? So it has to be a good, strong research plan. Uh, you know, um, but it, uh, they're funding you uh, at the end of the day. So like, how is it going to support your training and enable you to transition to the next career phase? Uh, like if it is continuing in the same direction that you are that you have pursued, if there is no new training component involved, that's slightly looked unfavorably. They want you to see getting new expertise, new skills, which will differentiate you from your graduate advisor and your postdoc advisor. Uh, what else? I think these are the three major ones. Then, of course, they worry about, uh, you know, other things, if there are animal protocols involved, or but they're not going to be major score drivers. Uh, Maza, you have thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I can uh, share the share my slides about uh, what I wrote in in my proposal. Probably that's easier. Um, yeah. So, uh, like I said, for Bruce Welcome, um, it has several rounds. Uh, first, it asks for a pre proposal. And that pre-proposal is like one page limit. So what I wrote in my proposal is that I divide this one page limit into several sections. Um, and I wrote about the background of my research and very the aims very briefly, just one sentence for each aim. And also I, uh, I also mentioned um, why this uh, proposal is important for me to transition to an independent career and why I'm the person that's suitable, suitable for carrying this research. And this is the competitive advantage. I think that is a very good section that you can mention about your previous training background and why your previous training background give you unique uh, opportunity to answer the question that you propose. Um, and then you can uh, talk about what kind of research resources that you have, um, like uh, you can get access to core facility or like HPC system in the university. And lastly, you can mention about uh, why your research is important by mentioning about the broad impact, how it can benefit our society or human health. Um, so this is for the pre-proposal. I hope that you can have a brief idea about what uh, people expect to uh, see uh, at this stage. Um, and for the full proposal, um, uh, for Bars Welcome, it has six page limit. And I um, divide this six page limit into this following five sections. Um, for, for me, I talk about uh, like, uh, I, I apply for Bars Welcome when I get the first paper from my postdoc. So I use the first section to talk about what I did uh, in that paper um, and what are the significance of that research. And then I use the NIH format for the work plan. I talk about the background um, aims. For each specific aims, I will give timeline and also alternative strategies, like uh, if, if the method that I propose in my aim doesn't work out, so what are the other ways? And then I talk about future outlook, uh, like something that you want to do in next five or 10 years. And then um, the career objective part, I use that section to uh, mention how this award can help me uh, build my career. Like I can use this award to go to conferences that I like, like or build collaborations with other research labs. And lastly, uh, this is the section that I always write uh, even in the pre-proposal, I write competitive advantage. And in the full proposal, I will leave us just one paragraph describe why I'm the best person to perform the research. And again, talk about your training background. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this. Yeah. Billy, mm -hmm. you have any thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I guess for uh, postdoc fellowships, uh, uh, I don't, you don't you don't need to have a very elaborate like for example like budgets or uh, something uh, structure, uh, but I mean in the in the research proposal you do need to um, impress maybe impress the committee that your research is innovative, 
and it's uh it's it's doable. So um so so I, I like like my job. I also came from a, a a very different background uh in my PhD. So in my PhD I studied liquid crystals, uh soft matter physics. So nothing nothing living there, uh no 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 organisms. Uh and I transitioned to uh bacterial biofilms. And uh, I and I had in mind that I wanted to uh, bring some of my expertise uh, from my PhD training into into this field, and uh, and so that's what I pitched in my research research proposal, and and I I tried to uh, I talk about like how we could study uh, like for example the crystal order, and uh, like and cell shape cell shape regulation and the crystal order the the biofilm architecture. And how that connects to uh, gene expression in biofilms. So I guess in the I guess um, if we combine uh, like for example for example if you have a let's say a multidisciplinary background, uh, I think first uh, don't don't waste that. Uh, you want to uh, leverage that, uh, make the best use of, out of it, and and I think that's also a very good way to to bring innovation into into a research uh, proposal. So. I think probably that's what probably that's one thing I did right because um I got funded um so yeah that's my that's my experience thank you much Benny um I was also wondering like after getting these uh great fellowships like how did it how did it like uh receiving these things how did you change or shape your research or career trajectory like did you start asking different questions or like something else you could start bolder uh I'm gonna Let's start. Um, I don't think it changed particularly anything uh, in terms of day-to-day -day research. Like I was, again, like, you know, this is a continuation of what you were doing. Um, you would more or less continue what you're doing. It does provide some flexibility to, um, so K Award like gives you some money for, or the majority of the money is back loaded. Uh, that is when you start your own lab. So that's helpful. So I think in my case, what it did help with, number one, it helped me at an early stage chalk out what my lab, my independent lab is going to work on. Like I had to really write it down in, in the proposal. Um, you know, of course, you will veer off from what you proposed five years ago when you started, like compared to when you start your lab, but it's still good to have that document, you know, just start thinking about it at, at an early stage while you're still a, a postdoc. It also helped me think about, you know, actual numbers, you know, if I get, you know, I think um, K funds 250K direct plus to indirect per year. So, yeah. you know, what equipment can I buy for my independent lab? How do I chalk out those experiments? So some of these things as you apply for your job, you will need to do perhaps towards the later stage of your interview or job applications. Uh, but, you know, having an early start on it really helped. Is really thinking about how these, you know, what kind of funding do I need um, for an independent research program? Like if I need to buy a microscope, how much it will cost? So, so th these kind of things were helpful. Um, what else was, uh, what else did change? Yeah, actually, yeah. I was able to purchase an equipment, which, uh, you know, from, from my research funds, just to try out one crazy idea, uh, which, which was helpful. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Benny? How did it change uh, your approach to research? Or um, so, I mean, I feel like some people may expect there could be some flexibility uh, for a postdoc, uh, whether you are externally funded or you, if you are directly funded by by the advisor. Uh, uh, I I cannot speak to that too much because I I mean I only have one postdoc advisor. I couldn't. I, uh, it's hard to say whether uh, that that's a, that's the case. But I do think financially, it's it's quite uh it's it's quite liberating so you, you so for example like david royan you uh there's a four four years of funding so and actually that that's something pretty good about david royan so it's four years of funding and compared to other fellowships and for example i also got jane coffin childs which was three years and because four years were three years and that was the reason why i chose uh four years and i think so you, you know you pretty much know that you have stable funding for four years and i think that really gives you a uh, some some space and some peace of mind for you to really think about what you you want to do in these in these four years, and how uh, how how you would plan your career career stage, right? Like uh, at at which year you will start to maybe uh, 
uh, apply for the funding for next stage and at, at, at what at what year you start to uh, be on be on the job market so so I think this really uh, helps quite a bit I have I have I'm grateful for the funding I have enjoyed the I would say the liberty that comes with comes with it yeah so that's pretty much it that's great why is that yeah, I, I think I agree all the points that Anchor and Benny mentioned. Uh, I just want to add one more point that uh, once you get your own funding, you have more opportunities to choose the conferences that you're interested in to go without asking for your advisor's uh, permission. So I think this is one extra freedom that you can get uh, for having your own funding. Yeah, and also, it, like uh, we can try our own crazy ideas and have enough uh, resource for that. Yeah. Oh, it's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, so before uh, opening opening for the audience questions, I just have one more question to ask. Like, what is the one piece of advice you would give to a postdoc today applying for these independent funding positions? Uh, let's start, Maza. Do you want to have any advice for the today's somebody wants to apply today or? Uh, Rose, welcome. Um, I think, uh, definitely for um, one advice will be uh, think about the application early because, like I said, I I only realized that around the end of my second year uh, that I I need to apply for funding and I should. Um, so I think if you have this mind, probably uh, have this in mind, probably at the end of your PhD and plan ahead of time, that would be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, Benny? Yeah, I think I agree. And then, um, yeah, I think be mindful of the opportunities. And also, uh, as I said, I think uh, writing for fellowships or for grants, it's a, it's a good exercise and it will be an integral part of your career. So, so uh, yeah, so you want to uh, probably adapt the lifestyle if you, if you want to go to acad academia, probably this would be a very big part, if not the most biggest part of the of your career. So, yeah, start early and then, uh, yeah, be mind be mindful of the opportunities. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I completely agree. Like you know, start early; it's going to propel your career. I just wanted to kind of uh, towards as we're ending, you know, inching towards the close of the session. Um, it's good to have these fellowships, but don't let yourself be defined by these fellowship. You know, you are more as a scientist than just a recipient of some award. There is a lot of subjectivity in how these things are evaluated. And as much as the review panel tries to, you know, do justice, they are evaluating you through a few pages of written documents. So th there is a lot of subjectivity. There are other things into play. So it's great to get it. Uh, even if you don't get it, it is not, you know, uh, it doesn't, it's not, a, don't take it as a personally as a, a comment on your ability and capacity as a scientist. Right. Thank you so much, Ankur. Uh, now open the platform for the audience. If anybody have, uh, our participants have any questions, I believe you can type it in the chat. I can uh, ask to the panelists and we can have discussions. We have about like 15 minutes more. So if anyone have any burning question or even your own application that you're writing or plan to write, or uh, if I miss, miss a question, please ask here. Can I add one piece till the questions are coming in? Yeah. So one very practical advice for um, NIH applications in particular. So I think over the last five years, something changed about the NIH guidelines where they, again, like uh, valuing the mentoring aspect of the grant, they often want a mentor who is experienced in putting trainees in a in a you know in independent positions. So if in case you are working with a junior PI like myself, you know, like an assistant professor who does not have a track record of placing uh, people in, in independent academic positions, get a co-mentor. Uh, so this is a lesson that a couple of people in my lab learned the hard way, and I hear similar stories from many people around. That, that's a video speaker advice. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, I can also maybe add to that a little bit. So in the in the guidelines from Demon Royan Fellowship, they, they actually encourage people, uh, applicants, 
uh, who, whose sponsor is a junior, junior PI to, to get a co-sponsor who is a, who is a uh, established uh, more senior PI. So that's also what I did. Um, I, I took their guidelines seriously. So uh, yeah, probably it's a, it's a good strategy. Yeah. Cool. Um, maybe I'm not able to see any questions for some reason in the chat. Uh, okay, I have uh, one more question to ask. Um, like, how did you ask for feedback for preparing the application? Like, how like did you ask? Like, uh, I'm pretty sure your mentors, but did you also reach out to more people? Uh, previous uh successful applicants. Did you? Uh, how did you like start? Did that? Like, did you get uh, feedback from? Them? Uh, Maza. Um. For me, I, I, well, I, I do have one resource that I think I can probably share here. It's about this uh, it's writing book. And I feel this is a pretty practical one that I followed it a lot when, when I'm preparing for the funding. So I, I would strongly suggest you to, to uh, <laughs> get some kind of uh get some time kind of suggestions or um practical guidance from all these kind of resources um um i i so for uh, for the pre proposal and the full proposal i didn't um i i only um go through these proposals with my mentors uh but for the interview section uh when I know that there's a 50% that I can get this award, I actually talk to more people, like uh, um, get feedback from my friends uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, people outside my field uh, to listen to my five minute talk. Um, so yeah, this is my experience. Great. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, letting somebody experienced uh, see it who has written and participated in a few study sections, that's good. If you can get uh, examples of previously funded grants, that's that, that's good. There are many formulaic things like, you know, adding a timeline of events as a table uh, somehow that, that that's easy for the reviewers to see. Make, make it easy for the reviewers and seeing some examples or giving it to a person who has participated in, in a study section is a good idea. Uh, Benny? Uh, yeah, I think it's always good to consult people. And then uh, in my case, like I talked to people uh, who got the Damon Royal Fellowship. And then basically, I think I think sometimes there's a there's a question whether like whether uh, I should apply to this fellowship or not. Should I even uh, take take the time to do it? Um, yeah, especially for Damon Royal, when you look at their website, it looks like, oh, we are super hardcore cancer research foundation. Yeah, but, but after talking to these people and looking at the fellowship uh, awardees, you, you realize like, yeah, that like practically uh, there's a chance you could get it. So I think this and also other advices from uh, like from other PIs and also from other people who got it, I think it's all very helpful. Thank you. I think there's a one question from Vignesh. Let me see. Uh, Vignesh, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, the chat was disabled, so I could not uh pose oh. the question um i, I i'm in a similar position as um where my jail was i'm doing soft metaphysics and biophysics uh the question i had was uh we're talking about the uh, the, the probability of getting a, a fellowship uh, about 50 percent, or just figuring out what are the different ways of knowing that is it just about making connections and talking to others who have done this or uh, just want to see what i might have missed this too um, but yeah, I just wanted to confirm that. Sorry, if I understand your question correctly, so you're you're asking about the rates of getting funded for exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, uh, when I applied two years ago, I think there were two hundred applicants initially, and there are. Um, there were probably 11 awarded. So yeah, yeah that is the rate for for the bars welcome uh, two years ago, yeah. 
Got it. Thank you. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a, another quick question is, is there a possibility to access a recorded version of this webinar? I might have missed a few sections of this. So just yeah, it is currently being recorded and it will be posted awesome. in the Engage website. So you can find it there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, I think thank you everyone for the panel. It has been great and very informative to me and everyone in the audience. Uh, if you have any any parting advice to incoming uh, postdocs, please, uh, if you have any few words to say, Benny. Uh, oh, advice to to uh, 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 like postdocs. Yeah, maybe like a parting words. Oh, a what? And maybe like a parting, parting words. words. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, good luck and then have fun and enjoy enjoy life, enjoy work. <laughs> uh, uh yeah i mean i mean i mean work is part of part of your life right so uh mm. take it seriously but it's not it's not everything in your life so uh yeah i mean good luck and then um enjoy Maza? um i i think i really agree with sanka's point that getting rejection is not the end of the world and uh, there are still a lot of opportunities that you can explore. Um, yeah, take it easy. Uh, postdoc funding is not a big thing in your life. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think um, maybe two related themes. Um, uh, uh, like, I think there is increasing um, realization that careers in academia, there's a like departure from academic uh, um, jobs, and especially like postdoc uh, is is slightly anxiety provoking. I, I know like I was anxious when I was a postdoc, you know, just this uncertainty whether you'll be able to make it or not. And you're trying to evaluate it based on these metrics. Do I have a uh, you know, this named Damon Runyon, Jane Coffin, or some other prestigious fellowship, do I have K99, et cetera? Um, and and, and the, the anxiety is that, oh, if I have it, I'll be able to make it. So maybe I'll, uh, you know, um, just to perhaps soothe that anxiety if it, if it helps, you know. Um, in my generation, like when I was a postdoc, people call that postdoc is the best time to do research. I feel that that was not true for me. Being a PI is the best part of the part of being a scientist. I have enjoyed so much more since I have my independent uh, position. It's so much better than being a postdoc. Uh, so an academic career is really a lot of fun. I will not trade it for anything else. <laughs> so you know, if if you're feeling anxious during your postdoc, that's okay. Give yourself a break. Academic jobs are are you know, continue to be a lot of. You know, it's it's an enjoyable uh, life um, that, that you can pursue, very fulfilling life you can pursue in, long, in the long run. And again, yeah, don't be disheartened. Don't try to evaluate yourself by just these, you know, do I have a fellowship or not? You're more than just a few of these uh, tags. You'll need to get a thick skin in academia. It'll get used to it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank all of my panel members again. It was great uh, listening to your talk. Um, all these recordings will be available for the audience in the, in the audience member on the APS DBIO Engage website. It will be posted in the next few days. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you once again. Bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Nice to meet you. Yes. Bye-bye.